Hello, everyone, and welcome to our live session today. I will be going over a quick startup presentation to welcome you all and introduce you to our program and the various opportunities if you have not previously attended our live shadowing session. So Pre-Health Shadowing is a student-led, minority-led, women-led nonprofit dedicated to helping prospective healthcare professionals gain access to educational resources, no matter their demographic status, abilities, or location. My name is Muntaha, and I am the Editor-in-Chief here at Free Health Shadowing. So thank you all for attending today, and let's get started. So just a little PSA, we do have closed captioning for all of our students to accommodate all students. This setting is available on the bottom of your Zoom screen and it should be enabled. Let's see. All right. So after you uh, look on the bottom of your Zoom screen and it is not enabled, please message one of our team members and we will uh, assist you and with the uh, transcripts. But we are always looking for ways to be more inclusive and to ensure that our live sessions are accessible to everyone. So if you do have any recommendations, please uh, email us at info at freehealthshadowing.com. Our email is on the screen. So since this is an international program, we want to know where you all are Zooming from today. You can drop your location in the chat. I'm actually calling from Florida, but PHS headquarters is in California. It's nice to see where people are coming from, thank you. So if you want to stay in the loop and follow us on social media, we are active on Instagram and TikTok, and we are also active on LinkedIn. So you can sign up on our email list and we, you can look at how many sessions we have upcoming. We usually talk about our sessions that are upcoming through our Instagram, through our email list, and you can always look at our website. So we have some wonderful opportunities as with you all as benefits of being part of our program. We have partnered with Kaplan to get students a 10% discount code that can be used on all Kaplan products as well as free resources such as study guides to help prepare you for the standardized testing like the NCLEX, the NBOT, the MCAT or PCAT. So if you fill out our short survey in the chat, you will actually uh, get signed up for these deals for free. So we would also like to draw your attention to another amazing program here at the bottom of the screen, Neolith. Neolith is an online mental health platform for students and uh, for pre-health uh, professionals especially. We have a lot of stress and during the pandemic, it isn't easy. So we have partnered with Neolith to spread the word and offer free access to all of their services. So if you use the link pre-health, if you use the code pre-health on the link when signing up, you are able to have free access to their services. Additionally, we are really excited to announce that we have a crispy cream partnership and you can purchase one delicious uh, dozen of donuts to enjoy with your loved ones. And um, we are able, you are able to receive your treat while also helping us at PHS. This donation, you buy the dozen of donuts for $10 and you'll, uh, some of the proceeds will go to free health shadowing. So you'll be able to do, uh, enjoy some donuts and help us uh, as a nonprofit. More information and instructions can be found by clicking the link that will be sent in the chat. We also got our PHS merch. So here's the donuts. Uh, it's, linked, it's linked in the chat in case you didn't hear that. But we do have some PHS merch coming up. This is another way to help our organization and acquire a really nice cleat of clothing. We have t-shirts and long sleeves or hoodies and whatever you like to represent PHS and our mission. So you can uh, look at the link in the screen or click the link in the chat to get started and get your merch and your donuts. Mask for Mask is another partnership we have. It's an amazing women-led organization. And what they do is that whenever they sell for masks, they actually donate uh, for masks as well to the community. And you can think of people that are in the homeless community, uh, healthcare workers without proper PPE, and to just some people who are struggling to stay safe during the pandemic. So with our discount code PHS15, you can actually get 15% off your mask order. And if you buy through this method, pre-health shadowing will also get 10% of the proceeds, which is amazing because we are a nonprofit that runs solely off the support of our community. And plus you will be giving masks to people who really need it. So it's 
totally a win-win situation. If you want to play a bigger part in supporting PHS, we would love for you to join our program. We have uh, opportunities for asynchronously volunteering at your own time or synchronously volunteering by being a team member. You can apply to be either of the two in the links in the chat. And with the team member, you're able to be part of the administrative team and to lead students in various projects and initiatives with professional outreach, grant writing, the editorial team, and social promotion, and so many more that we have. We understand that as a pre-health student, you may not have the time. So we also offer that opportunity to volunteer asynchronously. And you can have uh, your tasks at any time of day. So if you are a high school student and want to get involved, we have started a program called HTP, which stands for High School Training. This is a way for high school students to get connected to leadership and healthcare education. And they're able to see what kind of healthcare field they want to go into or if they want to go to healthcare field at all. And it's just a way for you to be more familiar with how healthcare is taught and how healthcare, how the work is in the healthcare fields and the medical field. So that, that is a really good uh, resource if you are a high school student. And if you're interested in being an ambassador, please use the link in the chat to nominate yourself. Um, we also want to recognize the hard work of our students. So if you have any reflections from our live sessions, any articles about sociological, psychological, or medical phenomena, or reviews and success stories of your personal life, you can definitely submit your writing through www.prehealthshadowing.com slash blog submissions. And I'm actually the editor in chief, so I'll be reading them and having them published on our website. And I'm really excited to see if anyone uh, writes a reflection for this live session. So if you're interested in that, uh, use the link in the chat to submit your writing. So uh, if you can, we humbly ask that you donate to our program. As you know, pre-health shadowing is completely student run and we are working around the clock to keep this free and accessible to everyone. And unfortunately, Zoom and our website do cost a lot of money and some of the programs that we are going uh, we're starting to initiate to cost a lot of money as well. So we would greatly appreciate if you would be able to donate or actually tell some of your friends uh, and about our program and have them come to our live session. So throughout the session today, we encourage you to drop any questions um, in the chat and our team members will be making note of these and we will be asking them throughout the session. If you'd like to ask questions directly to the speaker, you may raise your hand and I will call on you. You can ask them during the presentation uh, or we can save them for later if you'd like to ask directly to the speaker. Otherwise, leave your questions typing in the chat. So we also want to remind you that you should take good notes as our professional is going over their presentation. We actually have a short 10 uh, question uh, post shadowing assessment. And what that does is verifies your virtual shadowing hours and you're able to receive a certificate if you pass the post shadowing assessment. So I will be giving you some information on how to take the post shadowing assessment at the end of the session. So please stay tuned. Lastly, if you can, we request that you turn your cameras on. This is by no means an obligation, but we are respectful of different circumstances. But if it does, uh, if you are able to keep your camera on, it does help uh, make us feel a little bit closer in the time we have to social distance. Um, we also request that you make sure to mute yourself during the presentation. You can only unmute yourself if I ask you to, if asking a question, so we don't distract uh, the presentation and disturb it. So I appreciate you all for listening, and I will go ahead and stop sharing so our uh, presenter can share their screen. Thank you, Muntaha, and hi, everybody. Let me get shared here. Okay, can you all see my presentation? Yes, we can, thank you. That's great. Okay, so welcome everyone. I see we've got about a good handful of students here. I'm really excited to meet you all and very happy to be presenting today. So um, my name is Kara Sandholt. I am a scientist by training. I am a health educator. Um, I currently am faculty at UC Davis in Northern California. I have taught 
all over Northern California, including in San Francisco, Sacramento, and the Davis region for about 13 years now. Um, currently, I teach for the Nurse Practitioner and Physician Assistant Program at UC Davis. Um, I also sometimes teach for the medical school and I work very closely with my UC Davis medical and veterinary school colleagues. So if y'all have questions about PA programs, nursing, nurse practitioner programs or medical programs, I'm happy to answer along any of those lines. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, I actually am teaching where I got my bachelor's degree. So um, I'm from Southern California for half of my life. I grew up in Los Angeles, moved up to the Northern California area for high school and went to UC Davis for my undergraduate. Um, while I was an undergrad at UC Davis, I started working with children with autism and I really found a passion for neurobiology, psychobiology and behavior. I also loved molecular biology and genetics. Um, and I decided that um, instead of applying to medical school, I actually decided to get my doctorate in neuroscience. It was a tough decision for me. Um, I thought about MD, PhD for a while, but I actually ended up just doing the PhD um, at UCSF. So I moved to San Francisco and I did my PhD at UCSF where I studied neurobiology. So um, for most of my PhD, I was doing advanced physiology, electrophysiology, um, a little bit of anatomy um, and learning a lot about the brain. Um, fell in love with that, but by my last couple of years as a neuroscientist at UCSF, I started teaching at USF, a local college in San Francisco, and I really found a passion for teaching. I was teaching general biology, uh, mostly to freshmen at USF, um, and I just found that my happiest days were teaching. Um, so I love science and I love learning about science. I found that I could learn a lot about science through teaching, and so I decided not to pursue an academic researcher career and decided to be an academic educator. So I moved from my PhD back to Sacramento and I started teaching. I taught at local community colleges in Northern California and I landed at UC Davis about six years ago teaching for the nursing school and the medical school. So I teach biology, I teach anatomy, physiology, and pathophysiology, which is a physiology of disease. And I've been doing that to clinical students for the last six years. So I teach gross anatomy. Some of you have probably heard about gross anatomy, a very famous course in medical school. So uh, we do a lot of anatomy dissection where we learn about different areas of the body. Um, we do that with both our PA nurse practitioner and our medical students. I also teach advanced physiology and pathophysiology for our PA and nurse practitioner students. Um, for fun, um, living in Northern California, we have a lot of beautiful hiking in the area. I spend a lot of time with my kiddos. Here's us hiking up in the Sierra Mountains, uh, not too far from where we are right now. I have uh, two little redheads. So these are my feisty redheads. And um, we spend a lot of time also at the local lakes and rivers here. So lots of swimming. Um, we compete in triathlons. Uh, and I'm a science nerd, so I love science. I'm happy to answer any of your questions about, you know, I love science, but I'm not sure where I want to use it. So if you're not sure exactly where you want to apply your science degree, I have lots of ideas for you. We can chat about it. Okay, so that's me and my background. So let me tell you a little bit about the program that I teach for. So I love this. I love this uh, picture, although it makes me a little bit sad. I haven't seen our students in person in quite some time. This was our 2020 graduating class. Um, there's me. I don't know if you can see me right there in the middle. 
um, every Thursday we we dressed up Hawaiian. We had quite a few students from this class who were from Hawaii, um, and so they got everybody to wear Hawaiian shirts on Thursdays. So this is one of our Thursdays wearing Hawaiian shirts in our class. So this is actually an interprofessional course. So many of you have probably heard the term interprofessional, um, and that's something we stress at the nursing school that I work at. So I work at the Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing, UC Davis. Um, and we're really passionate about teaching students the value of, you know, really working across the professions, understanding the expertise of our physical therapists, our occupational therapists, our nurses, our nurse practitioners, our physician assistants, um, our medical assistants, our, our mental health providers, um, as well as our physicians, um, and all of the range of interprofessional groups that are so important for keeping the medical profession going. So this is an interprofessional group. Some of our students come to us with nursing degrees and they are studying to be nurse practitioners. Some of our students come to us as medical scribes, which is actually a great way to get some experience prior to going to graduate medical education. Um, some of our students come to us after years of being medics and paramedics um, in the military. So we have a large number of veterans that come to us. Um, and a whole wide range actually of students. So we have a very diverse and interprofessional group and we focus on family medicine, which is primary care medicine. We do a lot of specialty as well, um, but our focus really is in primary care and getting our graduating students and future healthcare professionals out to underserved areas. That is areas that have less access to care. So the nurse practitioner and physician assistant role, both of those roles were created to serve areas where there was a physician shortage. So physician assistants as a career actually began in the military. Um, and then became a, a widespread um, career many years ago um, to serve underserved areas, areas where there are not a lot of practicing clinicians, um, rural areas, um, urban areas where there are just fewer, low, fewer access to physicians. Um, physician assistants, um, those of you who have heard of physician assistants, they work under a physician. So they have a physician that signs off and mentors them, and they have a wide range of um, autonomy. So it depends on the state um, and the, the, the different rules for each state. In some states, they have to have a physician sign off on everything that they do. And in other states, they can practice quite independently. Um, nurse practitioners, it's the same thing. They tend to be even more independent than physician assistants, um, and they can run their their practices um, to serve those areas where we have fewer physicians available. Um, they not only do primary care, but they also do a lot of specialty roles. So what's great about this group of students that you're seeing here is that they graduated last year. So we've been hearing back from all of them about they just finished their certification exams. They're all uh, getting their first jobs and getting out there and, and being mentored. And it's really fun to see where they're landing. So our class size is about 75 to 85 students. And normally our program is about 27 months. So they do one year of didactic coursework and a second year plus a little bit of clinical rotations where they're out in the clinic. So both our nurse practitioner and our PA students actually get out in clinical rotations fairly quickly. And I think a lot of students choose that over going to medical school because they are ready and excited to get out in the community and working. So I'm just curious in the chat, if you can all tell me how many of you know someone or you yourselves are interested in nurse practitioner or physician assistant programs? Have you heard of the physician assistant profession or the nurse practitioner profession? Oh, 
we have a few of you that are pre-PA. That's fantastic. Yep, and some of you know others. Yes, that's that's wonderful. Yeah, so we have lots to chat about, and I can talk to you um, about our about our PA program a little bit more. So, um, especially if you are interested in the UC Davis PA program, we have a great program. So, I'm happy to to answer some of those questions, and I'll be happy to um, enter into the chat later the the link to the UC Davis PA program. Um, it is a decision, it's a challenging decision um, between going to medical school, going to nursing school, going to PA school. Um, and I think the what I love about PA education is the focus on serving the underserved. Um, our students at UC Davis work at what we call student run clinics. Um, so we have a very unique program here where we have clinics serving various different communities um, that normally would not get care. Um, and they start working in student run clinics within a few months, well, in a non COVID year, <laughs> within a few months of being in our program, they're out serving the community, um, working with um, populations that are primarily Spanish speaking, um, primarily Hmong populations, primarily um, African American populations, primarily um, just so many different groups that we're serving with our students, um, especially we love it when our students speak multiple languages because we know that they can get out into the community um, and start helping um, many of our patients who, who uh, English is not their primary language. Um, so yes, uh, so Fernando's asking, did I hear that AAPA voted to change the name to Physician Associate? Yes, yeah, Fernando, so what you're seeing is actually a lot of legal changes in working to make the PA profession more independent. Um, there's a lot of work going on. Um, because we're serving these communities that often don't have physicians available or have very few physicians available, it's really important to advocate for as much independence as possible so we can really serve these communities. Yeah, that's great. Okay, so that's where I work. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about what I do. Um, so I am not a PA. I am not a nurse. I work very closely with my clinical colleagues to make my teaching sessions relevant to clinical students. But as I said, I'm a neuroscientist by training. Um, so I teach uh, in the gross anatomy laboratory. Um, I have worked on creating clinical reasoning sessions for gross anatomy. So this is taking the, the normal anatomy course where our students are either doing the dissections or viewing uh, dissections and learning about human anatomy, but actually really applying it clinically. So we get them in the lab and we qu quiz them on different disease conditions, um, different physical exam findings, as they're actually looking at the structures in the gross anatomy laboratory. Um, for this, I've worked with some virtual anatomy programs. Um, if any of you have played with some of these virtual anatomy programs, I've tried a lot of them. So I've used uh, Complete Anatomy from 3D4 Medical, which is fantastic. That's what you're seeing here, um, is one course that I created through the Complete Anatomy platform. I'm currently also using Visible Body, which is another excellent 3D anatomy program. Both of those programs are actually available publicly. I think they're usually about $20, $25 to purchase um, and really, really fun um, to play with and learn. So if any of you are taking anatomy right now, especially during the pandemic, if you're not actually in the lab, these virtual programs are beautiful. Um, the technology is so great and you can often click click on the structures and, and learn about all of the, the nerves and blood vessels and everything in that one tiny structure and where they all connect. So these programs are, are really cool. Um, so I've developed some clinical reasoning in the gross anatomy laboratory sessions. Um, I also do a lot of active learning, meaning that 
Um, I don't believe that in teaching anatomy, I should stand up in front of students and just point to structures. <laughs> um, I actually I think that's a terrible way to learn anatomy. Um, so what I actually, we like to teach through clinical cases. Um, so we give them patient case scenarios um, and different things to work through. It's a lot more problem solving. Um, we give them sort of puzzles to figure out and we do a lot of group discussion on what do you think you know, this certain condition sounds like, and, and what would you do? Um, so we do a lot of active learning at the Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing. Um, and that's what we focus on because we think learning is best when it's done together in diverse and interprofessional groups. Um, and it's best when we can really problem solve and learn from each other. So I develop a lot of that. Um, and um, also now working with some of our mental health providers um, to look at resilience, um, perceived stress, coping, well-being in our health professions students. So I currently have a collaboration across the medical veterinary and nursing school where I'm working with um, some of our experts and colleagues across the campus to look at resilience in our health profession students and how we can help our students through challenging times. Um, health profession school is challenging in a normal year. It's extra challenging during a pandemic when we don't have our, our usual social structures and when we have additional stresses like child care and elder care and, and social isolation. So that's these are my three current active areas of research. So I actually do um, research and publications in, in each of these areas. Um, so that is my research. Um, another fun project that I do, um, some of you may like to look at videos on YouTube for, um, you know, helping you through your current courses, depending on how your, your lecturers are lecturing or depending on your synchronous or asynchronous sessions at the university. Um, some of you may be familiar with Khan Academy or Osmosis, which are both excellent resources for medical education. I love both of those. I use them a lot with my students. Um, I also create a lot of lectures online for my students. And let's see, about, six years ago, something like that, five or six years ago, 2016, I started teaching hybrid courses where I was creating lectures, posting them online for my students. And then we would do deep discussions in class labs and case studies. Um, I started posting lectures online about five, six years ago, and I just found it was easier to put them on YouTube. So I know I'm, I'm not very creative. My YouTube channel is called physiology for students. <laughs> I know that's, if you guys have ideas for a better name, I'm open. So I shorten it. Now we, we just call it P4S. Uh, we have a website now where students can go and, and get the PowerPoint slides that go along with the lectures. Um, I've got some older lectures on there from 2016, but I also have some newer ones that we're developing that are for clinical students. So my original lectures were for pre-health students like you all taking physiology and my my new series is clinical physiology so that's my youtube channel i love it um, we've got yeah, somewhere in the ballpark of 40 or 50,000 students now um, that that are on my youtube channel and i get wonderful emails all the time from students all over the world um, who need help with physiology and I love answering their questions and just connecting. I think it's um, the YouTube community is a wonderful place to spread education and, and free education um, no matter where we are in the world. Um, so that's my YouTube channel. <laughs> Fernando says he just subscribed. <laughs> Okay, so um, uh, I would love to actually ask you all a little bit um, before we move on to my last piece of just pre-health advice. I'd like to ask you all a little bit about um, your interests and, and what you're, you're looking forward to. So I see some of you are pre-PA. Um, what are the rest of you doing? What, what pre-health careers are you all interested in? So students, I've actually released a poll so we can kind of read the room of where our students are at and 
uh, what professions they're interested in. So you can go ahead and look through the poll and answer it. So where are you in your healthcare education? What degrees are you interested in obtaining? So we're just gonna give it 40, 30 more seconds. Awesome. I'll just go ahead and end the polling. Thank you, Mutaha. Mm -hmm. So let's see. So some of you are in high school, which is fantastic. We've got some lower and upper classmen, and we have some professional students as well. That's great. We have some students who are MD, DO, RN, nurse practitioner, BSN. Is there more to that poll, Muntaha, going down a little further for question two? Yes. Ah, there it is, PA. Okay, so we do have a group of, of PA students as well. Um, so those of you who, who are in that space, um, what specialties are you interested in? What, what areas of medicine are you most interested in? OB we have some people in the chat saying OBGYN. Cardiology, dermatology. And some are not sure yet. Orthopedic surgery, pediatrics, not sure. It's okay to be not sure. <laughs> so I'll tell you that, so for, for our program, um, we actually allow our student, not allow, we actually require um, our students to do a number of clinical rotations before they graduate. So in our program has to do a women's health rotation. Um, everyone in our program has to do a primary care rotation. Um, and everyone has to do a surgery rotation before they graduate. And, and what I think is really interesting um, about uh, these students is that, um, you know, as, as they go through, some of them will say, oh, absolutely. I think, you know, I definitely, I would never ever want to go into hematology, oncology. I'm not sure I could work with patients who, who have cancer. I just, you know, I just, I think that would be too hard for me. Or I, I never think that, that I would be interested in surgery. It's just not something I'd want to do. Um, and then they get in and they do their rotations and they have these incredible experiences and they find, oh, this actually, this really fits. So sometimes you just, you get in there and, and you find out that it's not what you expected. Um, I would say for those of you that are interested in surgery, especially, um, so orthopedics, general surgery, um, cardiology, especially if you're going to be doing cardiothoracic surgery or something like that, um, this is where the anatomy piece is really important. Um, so if you have the opportunity to take a gross anatomy or an anatomy course, during your undergraduate career before you go to medical school, it would be really, really worthwhile. Not all of our medical and PA schools require anatomy. Um, I know we do. So UC Davis PA program and nurse practitioner program, we do require that students have taken anatomy. Um, our medical school actually doesn't require that students have taken anatomy. Um, but I would absolutely, if you're interested in surgery, orthopedics um, or related professions, if you can take anatomy before you get into your professional program, it will help you a lot um, just because it's one of those areas that is so dense and detailed that if you try to take it first pass um, in your medical or clinical program, sometimes it just goes too quickly. Um, and if you miss a few things in the beginning, you don't have time to catch up. So um, if you really, really want to be successful um, in your first year of your clinical program, if you get the chance to do 
some anatomy, especially if your school has a, the opportunity to do gross anatomy, it'll make your first year of your clinical program go much, much more smoothly. Um, for those of you who are interested in, in women's health and OBGYN, that's fantastic. Um, I love to see that. We, we have such a need um, for good women's health providers um, and, and to get uh, OBGYN. So if you're interested in women's health, actually nurse practitioner and PA programs are wonderful. Many of our students are actually finding placement in offices with clinicians um, who, for example, um, there's a, a primary care office and the clinician is just less comfortable being the women's health provider. So many of our nurse practitioner and PA students actually will become the women's health care specialist at that primary care practice. And some of you uh, may have actually had that experience where you go to your doctor's office and the PA or the nurse practitioner is the women's health provider. So nurse practitioner and PA programs, we do a really great job of preparing our students for women's health because it's definitely in need. Um, and it's a very important part, part of our profession. Let's see what else, pediatrics. Um, Pediatrics is such a wonderful place um, to be. So those of you who are, are interested in, in pediatrics, um, I would say <laughs> um, you actually want to learn your infectious disease really well. I know that sounds really strange. Of course, you need to be good with kids and you need to have a lot of patience. Um, but actually in pediatrics, we, we deal with a lot, um, a lot of infectious disease, right? Kids, kids get lots of bugs. Um, so one of the things if you're really interested in pediatrics is that you might want to think about some immunology. Um, and also genetics is also really important for pediatrics because of our congenital and genetic conditions. So if you're really interested in, in pediatrics, I would suggest um, that you brush up on your genetics and your immunology because that will be very, very, very useful for you. Um, let's see. Well, I think we are almost at the point where I will give you guys a chance to just ask questions. Um, one thing I will say um, is I, I, found, I found this little, this little poem online as I was preparing for this session because uh, Nina, who helped to organize these sessions, um, said, you know, students like to have some career advice. Um, and I often, so I'm on the admissions committee for our physician assistant program. And so I often meet students when they're interviewing for our program um, and in various stages of, of applying to our program. And um, when they first start out or sometimes in the summer, they, they, will, they will ask us, what do I need to do? What textbooks should I get over the summer? What, what is it that is going to make me a perfect candidate for your school or for your program? Um, and, you know, I could give you a list of textbooks and I could give you a list of courses to take. Um, but the most important thing um, is that you have a passion for healthcare and that you have a passion for what you do. Um, and everybody's path is different. So what we say at UC Davis is that we are not looking for any one type of student. We value each and every one of you for who you are and for what you can bring from your community to our community. Um, because ultimately to serve the communities around us the best, we all need to bring in our expertise from our different communities. Um, and so this poem is walking my path. So uh, this is my road to walk. Others can walk it with me, but no one can walk it for me. The moment I accept my power to leave an impression on the world, life becomes a joy to live. My own acceptance frees me to enjoy the path I'm walking, the one that feels like my own. I free myself to shine my own light by not standing in my own light. I intend to live a life that feels like my own. And so I have a healing influence on everything in the world around me. And what I love about this is that just by being who you are and by representing 
your community and by representing all of the passions that you bring with you to the health professions, um, that shines through and can be incredibly healing. So don't think of a particular type of person or a particular type of student that you need to be. Um, be yourself and be it fully and go through each path fully with that acceptance that when, when you really reach for what it is that you love and care about, um, you will find your path. So that is, that is all. I will, I will open it up. Muntaha, is it okay if we open it up to questions? Absolutely. Thank you so much for that amazing presentation in the last bit with the poem. It was really inspiring. Um, we can move on to questions. Students, I'd just like to remind you guys that if you had any questions, you can type it in the chat or you can raise your hand, use the raise hand function on the Zoom in the bottom of your screen, and I will call on you so you can ask any questions you have to the speaker directly. So we had a student ask that they are actually majoring in human physiology and they are taking the anatomy and physiology sequence next year. And they'd like to hear any advice before they jump into the realm of anatomy next year. Absolutely. Um, so I taught the anatomy and physiology combined course for many years um, at both the community colleges and Sac State. Um, two things that can make you very, very successful for anatomy and physiology. One is to fully dedicate your time to those courses. What, what I used to tell my students in the A&P courses is that that course is a full-time job. Um, and often there are a lot of obligations, both course obligations and family and home obligations that can make it difficult to get the studying time in that you need to really be successful in anatomy and physiology. There's a lot to memorize and a lot to process. So as best you can, if you are in an anatomy and physiology course right now, or if you know you're going to be doing that, as best you can really, really communicate with your family and your friends, um, your passion for what you're doing and your dedication and let them know that, you know, it, it may be challenging time-wise for you to do some of those extra things that, that you normally do during that time. a &P courses take a huge time commitment. So you need family and friend support to be able to do that. Um, and, you know, everybody's in a different place in terms of the time commitments they can do for those courses, but make sure that when you have an A&P course scheduled, that you don't schedule a lot of other difficult courses at the same time. We have students that do it, so they will take microbiology um, and A&P at the same time, but I would say that it's very, very difficult on those students. So try to lighten your course load during the A&P semester so that you can really focus on, on learning all the structures and the processes that you need to learn. Uh, the second thing is, is find your study buddies. Um, so getting through these A&P courses takes both social support and study support. So sometimes you, you know, you're in a box when you're studying. And if you have a study partner who's willing to help you back and forth, you know, there may be some areas that you're really good at that you can help your study partner with. There may be some areas that they're really good at that they can help you with. So find someone, one or two other students who are equally dedicated, who will have focused study time with you. Um, get a really good study group going because we learn best when we ask questions of each other and explain things to each other. So you, you find a big whiteboard and you draw everything out. Uh, yes, Lucy says, don't take OCHEM lab with A&P. Yes, don't do it. <laughs> don't do it. Try to lighten your course. <laughs> I had it on my calendar and I'm rethinking it now. <laughs> so yeah, try as much as you can to, to lighten that load, that, that semester or quarter, whatever system you're on and find your study buddies. Um, not the study buddies that's going to distract you, but the study buddy that's going to be really dedicated. And even if you just study quietly in the same room, just have the chance to stop and ask each other questions and explain things to each other. That's, that's golden. Yeah. Great. Thank you for that answer. So we've had a student 
uh, saying that the fact that you started your YouTube channel uh, six years ago was awesome. And thank you just for putting that effort into creating videos and content. But they had a question. Um, how did you figure out like when to start your YouTube channel and why did you initially want to uh, start it? I guess like the obvious answer would be like to getting lectures out to students, but why on the YouTube platform platform and not other platforms? Isn't that so funny? So um, it was actually kind of an accident. So at the time I was using Canvas as a learning management system and Canvas couldn't support the length of videos that I needed to post for my students. So five, six years ago, the technology was really different than it is now. Um, and it was actually easier for me to start a YouTube channel and post everything publicly on YouTube. And I thought, no one's ever going to watch these. I mean, if someone is really going to sit and watch an hour long lecture, go for it. It's going to be super boring, um, but I'll post them. And if, if it helps other people, then then great. It was really, they were created for my students at that community college at the time. Um, and then within a few years, I had, you know, thousands of students from all over the world sending me messages and saying, thank you so much. You know, this really helped me. I passed my exams because of you. And um, I love those emails. They just, um, for me, that YouTube community, sometimes on those really tough days, you know, when work is not so great, I get home and I have a couple emails from my YouTube students thanking me and saying they passed their exams because of the stuff I posted. And um, I'm so grateful. So I've kept them up and started creating new content for them too. So it was totally an accident. <laughs> That's so funny to hear. I'm actually an avid watcher of some of your videos because um, my anatomy courses are a lot. So thank you for that, just personally. Oh, I love to hear that, Muntaha. And, you know, actually, I've had a lot of students asking me to do more anatomy content. So I hope that I will. I'm, I'm going to finish the current clinical physiology series that I have, um, and then maybe I'll start doing more, more anatomy, too. Great, I look forward to that. So another student asked, what would you recommend to those looking to pursue a healthcare profession and also to help clin teach cl clinical students? Like what would you recommend those students have uh, done early on so they can get like some experience in uh, pursuing a healthcare profession at the same time as well as teaching students? Absolutely. Um, there's so many opportunities. So actually, while you're in your undergraduate program, what you may want to look for is opportunities to volunteer and teach in your community. Um, I did this both in my undergraduate and in my graduate programs. They had teaching opportunities where we went to local elementary schools, local junior high schools, um, and we were mentored by, by educators um, who ran the programs. So they were volunteer programs where we would go you know, I, I remember teaching some genetics to middle school kids and uh, chemistry to, to elementary school kids, you know, bringing the nitrogen and freezing things for them and um, going with, with other graduate students to teach in, in the classroom. Um, and that actually, for me, was really, really helpful for even my current clinical teaching because honestly, good education is good education. Um, if you learn education principles of teaching and learning for elementary school students, yes, it's a different level of student, but actually um, even teaching at your, within your local community can really help you teach later in your career. And then as you start working um, in your graduate program, and also when you leave and get a job, um, you can start teaching within those programs. So for example, when I was in my graduate program, we used to teach, when I was taking neuroscience, we used to teach anesthesiology, uh, we used to teach anesthesia to dental students. You know, how, what, what's, what are the mechanisms of anesthesia? Um, and they always need some guest lectures here and there. So if you just let others know that you're interested in teaching, um, the opportunities will, will flow. But actually the best opportunities are probably right there in your, your local community. Um, and then, you know, when you, when you get your job, um, start looking for opportunities, whatever institution you're at, to see if there are clinical programs that might need help 
you know, dental programs, medical programs, PA and P programs that might need lecturers and you can get in that way. Awesome, thank you. Um, another question we had was, what is your favorite part about your job? Oh, my favorite part. My favorite part about my job is these guys, where are they? Oh, I stopped sharing, <laughs> it kicked me out. Let me show you again. My favorite part, you know, it's funny. Um, some people will say, you know, most of my students call me Dr. S. Dr. S, how can you teach the same thing year after year after year? Don't you get bored, you know, teaching about the blood flow through the heart or, or whatever? Um, yeah, the, the, the system is the same. Um, but honestly, the, the best thing are the students. The students change every year and I have the opportunity to work with and see them from their admissions interviews all the way to graduation and into their jobs and I get emails from them when they get their jobs and you get to see them grow into future clinicians and serve their communities and um, so even though I'm not out there actually serving the community as a healthcare professional, um, I am helping hundreds of students serve their community. Um, and I love that. It's wonderful. I wouldn't give it up for anything. Awesome. Another question asks, uh, what kind of research have you been involved in? So when I was in graduate school, um, I did neurobiology. So I studied learning and memory in songbirds. Um, so my early publications under my maiden name, which is Hampton, um, I, I did some publications about uh, songbird learning um, and recovery from injury in birds and behavioral studies in birds. Um, and now um, I don't do animal research anymore. Now my research is classroom research. So it's, it's uh, creating the classroom sessions for the students and seeing how it goes. Um, creating interventions for resilience and, and, and uh, mental health for our professional students and, and seeing how they do. So now my classroom is, is my lab um, and that's, that's, that's currently where I'm focusing my, my research efforts. Awesome, that's so interesting. You did research on birds. Yeah, birds are, birds are fascinating um, and songbirds especially, a good proportion of their brain um, the way that we have areas of our brain that are dedicated to speech and speech learning, yeah. they have areas of their brain that are dedicated to song and song learning, which is, it was really cool. Very neat. Yeah, it's it seems like they have a little culture of their own with mimicry and stuff like that. Yes, um, another question we had was, if there was a role model in your life that you revered and motivated you to pursue your profession, and if so, what kind of qualities do you suggest that indicate a good role model or a good mentor? Perhaps be it relatives, teachers, or just uh, friends. Yes, yeah, so I'm gonna stop sharing now so I can see your faces. Um, gosh, I've had so many wonderful mentors. My, my first most important mentor in my undergraduate career was a new faculty member who was teaching an advanced neuroscience course. She had just gotten hired and she taught a seminar course where we got to read primary research papers. Um, and it was the first time I had ever read primary research um, and just loved it. Um, and she actually, she and I just got along really well. I was that nerdy student that would go up after class and just say, oh my gosh, this is so interesting. I wanna hear more about this study. And um, you know, I just read those papers just over and over and over again. Um, and after I finished that class, she offered me a position working in her lab. So instead of going straight to graduate school, I worked for a year in her neuroscience lab um, and just had a wonderful experience there doing, doing research for her and, and getting some publications with her lab. Um, and her name was Kim McAllister. She's still at UC Davis. She's an incredible faculty and researcher. Um, she really helped me. Um, I've had some wonderful mentors over the year, but she was, she, she was the first one who really, you know, supported me in science and gave me a job in her lab and, and let me ask her all the questions about, should I do MD? Should I do PhD? What should I do? Um, it was really, really wonderful opportunity. I think if, if you have the chance to work in a lab, 
um, if you have any instructors in your um, at your university or at your college that are doing research and you're interested in what they're doing, see if they have a lab assistant position um, because you can really, you'll have probably just a few people in that lab um, and you can learn a lot about the science behind what they're doing and, and why they're doing what they're doing, which is really fun. Yeah, I can imagine it must be so fun with that. Um, another uh, question that we had was, could you go through a clinical case example with us? You've been through some of them, but could you go through one that's like kind of stuck in your memory and really interesting? Uh, oh, I think that was Fernanda, actually. I saw that in the chat. You know what, Fernanda, what I would say is, um, so if you love clinical cases, um, one of the things I do on my YouTube channel and my new clinical series, after, after every lecture, I post a couple of clinical application videos, sort of like knowledge checks that you can do. So if you're really excited about that, um, you, you could actually hop on there um, and try out some of those, I call them challenge questions. So I take the, the clinical physiology that we just learned and I'll do a challenge question. So I think uh, the one that I did last week was on, um, what did we talk about? I think it was potassium homeostasis. What happens um, in the body when you have high and low potassium? What does that do to the electrical activity of the cells? Why, why, do, why do patients with high and low potassium, why are they both fatigued? We kind of talk through some of those things. So Fernando, there's so many nerdy things I could spend hours doing fun clinical cases with you, um, but join, join me on my YouTube channel. And if there's things that um, you're interested in that, that you want, um, I actually love suggestions um, from students on my channel. So you guys let me know what, what would be fun for you to do. Great, thank you for that awesome response. So one of the other questions that we had was what extracurricular activities were you really involved in with during college? And uh, the student was asking about how they have involvement culture in college where they're, they're kind of pressured to be involved in this and that and be really well-rounded. So they're asking like what kind of uh, extracurricular activities were you involved in that really helped you like develop better as a person and just develop professionally. You know, this is exactly why I, I put that last poem in at the end, because I think, I think often students are, there's so much pressure, right, about how you should be to, to be this perfect student for, for a clinical program. Um, and I think you do the thing that is most exciting and, and best for you. Right. Uh, I mean, certainly don't don't sit in your room and, <laughs> and and do nothing. Right. But what we want to see from our students is that you have passion in your life um, and that you apply your passions. And so I have had in in interviews for our PA admissions program, we often ask our students about where where have you shown leadership um, in in your career? Um, and I've had so many great examples. And some of our students have talked about, you know, um, being leaders of sports teams. Um, some of our students have talked about being leaders in their community. They came from very difficult backgrounds um, where they were in and out of homeless shelters. And so they decided that they were going to work with, um, you know, homeless populations in their community to try to lift up those populations. Um, we've had students who've shown leadership in um, being translators for their family because they are the only person in their family who speaks English. And so they have to go with them to all of their medical appointments and be that person that advocates for health in their family. And you know what? Every single one of those is an incredible leadership opportunity. And so serving your family and serving your community, all of those are valid and important things. So when you have dedication to something, that's the important piece. Um, for me, you know, I had a pretty run of the mill undergraduate experience. I, I, worked, I worked very closely autism. Um, and I was really passionate for the preschool age children that I worked with. 
Um, and I actually did a lot of background research to try to understand at that time, we didn't know a lot about autism. So I worked with the um, leaders of the Mind Institute, which is an institute here at UC Davis um, that studies autism and related disorders. So I found my passion with the kiddos that I was working with um, in my side job. Um, of course, I also did fun things like I was on the water ski team and, <laughs> you know, I had a lot of a lot of fun during my my college career. And I think you guys really should be out enjoying enjoying life. Um, don't don't try to fit yourself into a mold. You can be leaders in so many places. Yeah, thank you for that answer. I think we see a theme with a lot of our speakers that tell students to not only think medical, medical, and just getting, just uh, worrying about having health extracurriculars. So much of your life kind of contributes to skills that you'll apply later. Like we had a few surgeons who said they took a pottery class and it helped them with their hand movements and a steady hand. So it's really diverse. And I think stressing about that could uh, definitely like bring too much pr pressure on you. And you Absolutely. can, there's different perspectives to think about that. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, we had another question regarding interview skills. Uh, do you have any tips on how to improve one's interview skills? I tend to get nervous a lot, especially when talking one-on-one. -on -one. The most important thing for interview skills is practice. Practice, practice, practice. So have other students or have someone in your family ask you some common interview questions. Um, if you Google common interview questions for your chosen career, I'm sure you'll find some, you know, it's usually, why do you want to be in profession X? <laughs> you know, what brought you to this? There's some very common interview questions. So get a few of those and actually write out your answers. So when you're sit seated at home, quiet, there's no one pressuring you to give the answers, think about what you want to say to best present yourself during that interview. Have a few of those things already written out and practice it with someone because when you get in these situations, you can be very nervous. But if you have said it out loud a few times to your cat or to your grandma or whatever, um, then when you're in that er interview, you've kind of already practiced that language. So practice, practice, practice for the interview. Yeah. Um, regarding applications, we had a student ask if there is a difference if they had experiences and leadership skills in a different setting, like perhaps a different country, does that still count if they want to apply for a program in another country? Specifically, we have, let me see, Saba, she had a question. Uh, she said, I am an immigrant and I have worked in a dental clinic for war patients when I was in high school back in my homeland. Now I'm in Canada and I want to apply for MD. Uh, do you think mentioning that counts for my application or is it irrelevant because it's in a different oh, welcome country? To that. Yes. You know, every school is going to be different in their requirements. Um, so I will say, I know for our program that we accept and appreciate medical clinical experience from any number of backgrounds and it doesn't matter where that is. What we want is to know that you have worked in a clinical environment, that you know what it's like because there are ups and downs in a clinical environment. It's not what you see on TV, um, that you've been in that setting, that you've You've, you've seen it um, and that you've, you've, you've kind of seen the ups and downs and it doesn't, that, you know, that doesn't have to be in a particular, you know, special, it doesn't have to be orthopedics in New York, right? <laughs> I mean, it really, you know, for us, we want to know that you have really thought through your decision because what we don't want is a student to get a year into our program and to say, ooh, I, don't know. I actually, actually don't like working with patients. I don't, I don't think I want to do this. Then you have a lot of loans behind you um, when you really haven't had the, the chance, you know, and to leave partway through a program with all of the loans behind you would, would not be great. So you want to have enough clinical experience that you know what you're getting into. You have a, a real view of the challenges of working in the health profession that you're approaching. Um, and I think it's great if you have experience in another country. Thank you for that answer for that student. Um, we also had another question. Uh, they asked if, uh, how did you know 
where to go when you were uh, an undergraduate or graduate. Why did you choose anatomy and gross anatomy specifically? Why not neuroscience or other areas of the human body? So what, what I'll say is that I have always loved dissection. Even when I was a little kid, um, I used to go fishing with my uncles from Colorado and Utah and they would take all of us kids out on the boat um, and I would be the first kid there to watch them open up and fillet the fish and see what was inside the belly and um, I have just always loved dissection and when I taught general biology at USF we did lots of dissection um, when I taught a and um, at the various community colleges in the area we did lots of dissection so I have I have always been fascinated with dissection and the human body. Um, and when the opportunity at UC Davis came up, I, I jumped at it and I made sure to let them know how much I loved it and I wanted to learn. Um, and so, you know, you, you don't always know until you look back and say, oh yeah, that's true. I was that kid that <laughs> just wanted to see how everything worked, um, but I know it now, I know it now. So you, you, your loves just sort of follow you, right? Not always on purpose. Absolutely. I can totally relate to that. As a kid, I used to watch this British show called Inside Nature's Giants, and they would dissect huge, huge animals. And it was so much fun watching yes. that. And I think that's how I got into the medical field. Absolutely. I, I agree. Yeah. Um, there was another question a student asked, have you ever experienced burnout? And how do you deal with it? This is asking uh, for teaching um, and also just in absolutely absolutely I've experienced burnout in in research I've experienced burnout in teaching um, I've experienced burnout in my personal life um, actually it's very important I think to be aware of the signs of burnout um, some of the signs of burnout are withdrawal um, where you no longer have the bandwidth to greet someone in the hallway or spend that extra time with, with a, a student or a colleague who's asking you a question, you sort of have a, a short fuse, right? You see yourself sort of changing in that way. Um, I actually think it's very, very important to recognize the burnout when you know you, you know you have a lot of work to do, but you just can't make yourself do it. Right. Um, we talk to our health profession students about recognizing burnout because it's very important. Um, we all get burnt out at some point. Um, and then the question is, what do you do about it? Um, when I was in graduate school, I was really fortunate to have we had good mental health care and all of our graduate students had access to student healthcare the way that you do as a, a university student, graduate students also have that access. So it's really important to talk to your advisors, um, to talk to your colleagues um, and fellow students. If you see yourself kind of going down that road um, that you ask for the support that you have. And, and we're lucky as part of the university system that we do have access to the mental health care um, that is within the university. We actually even, um, as faculty, we have presentations from our wellness office all the time about making sure that we recognize the signs of burnout and that we know how to get through it. So <laughs> I've learned to recognize the ups and downs of academic life. And I've learned to be very careful about the way I plan my calendar. <laughs> so I know when, when the breaks are coming and you know, know when things are gonna be ramping up so that you can plan to also have some downtime because there are really challenging times. And then when the downtime comes, stop. <laughs> Don't do extra assignments. Don't plan crazy family activities. Just give yourself the time to breathe. And that can really help with the burnout. Absolutely, that's excellent and much needed advice. Thank you for that. We had a student ask, how is your work-life balance in regards to your profession and especially as a mother? Oh boy, isn't it challenging right now? <laughs> if you wanna ask work-life balance, there's no, there's no more challenging year than, than this year during the COVID year, right? So my kids are in the back room watching a movie right now, <laughs> right? So they actually love when I teach now because they get to watch movies. Um, so <laughs> But, you know, when you love what you do, you're going to take it home with you. 
you are. Um, and I love what I do. So I do take my work home with me. I, I wish that I could say that I don't take work home and I can completely turn off at the end of the day. Um, but the truth is I, I love what I do and I am messaging my students and my colleagues and, and everything all the time. Um, and so what you, what you learn to do is to set boundaries of when you are and are not available. Um, and that you have really good family support. So I'm very lucky that I have a husband who loves to be with my kids and also works very hard at his job. Um, so we take turns. So, you know, when he, when he has extra work to do, I support him and I watch the kids. And when I have extra work to do, he supports me and, and watches the kids. And we have a really good partnership in that way. So um, whether it's a partner or even neighbors or community members that you have supporting you, um, none of us can do this alone. I certainly, I certainly couldn't do this alone. Um, so you have to ask for help if you have a busy job. Um, and I do, I have a very busy job, but also my kids love science. And so sometimes, sometimes they'll be behind me, you know, while I'm lecturing, my nine-year-old will kind of peek in, mommy, were you teaching about bones today? You know, <laughs> uh, so, you know, you love what you do. Um, you just enjoy it and you bring your family with you when you can. Awesome. That's so cute that your child does that. Um, we had another question from Mayat. Oops, let me go back. Uh, Mayat asks, I'm planning to go to community college. So should I take anatomy and physiology at my community college? or um, at an, another university that he's going to transfer at. And he's asking like, what would like look better on applications um, if he takes it in community college versus university? Absolutely, Maya, I, I, I would say I taught the exact same class at the community college that I taught at Sac State. It was the same textbook. It was the same lectures. It was nearly the same labs, although the resources can be different at different schools. Um, but at the community college, I had 35 students. At Sac State, I had 200. And I was actually paid more at the community college than I was at the state university. So don't discount the value of community college faculty and community college courses. They can be incredible. They can be just as challenging and just as helpful as university courses. And sometimes at the community colleges, depending on the faculty member and depending on the resources, they can actually be even better because you will have a smaller course, meaning that the faculty can give you more individualized attention. So I think if you have a good community college group near you that has good resources for anatomy and physiology, it can be a great place to take some of those prerequisites. Um, so I would say go for it. And we are actually, as an admissions committee um, for graduate programs, we're not allowed to look at the institution that our students come from. Um, so it's actually, it would be discriminatory to say, um, you know, this student took classes here versus this student took classes here and admit a student because of where they took their courses. We're not allowed to do that. That would be totally unfair um, because your, your work is your work no matter where you do it. Awesome, thank you. And that's so refreshing to hear that you guys implemented that non-discriminatory like tactic for that. Um, so Carolyn asks um, that she had a little question about your life. Uh, have you ever experienced doubt in your place in medicine or just impost imposter syndrome? And how did you combat that? That's, uh, you know, that's, that's so interesting. Every day, imposter syndrome. <laughs> Every day, Carolyn. Um, I mean, uh, imposter syndrome is what we live with. Um, you know, I don't know if it's part of being a, a woman, um, if it's part of being raised by a single mother who didn't have a lot of resources. Um, every day you look around and you say, well, how did I get so lucky to be here? And why are, why are they still letting me do this job? <laughs> um, that's, it's, it's so normal. Um, the important thing is to not let it get in your way. So when you love what you do, even if you have those questions in the back of your mind, you just, you just go with it. 
well, they haven't fired me yet, so I'm still here. <laughs> um, and in fact, they keep asking me to do work for them. So, so there must be something that I'm doing right. Um, and yes, everyday imposter syndrome. And I, I think imposter syndrome is, is more common, more common than, than most people would admit. Most of us look around and say, I don't look or talk or feel like this person that I thought was supposed to be in my role. Um, and, and some of that is the fault of the, the media and the television that we grow up with, that we don't always see ourselves in these roles. Um, and some of that I do think is changing. Um, and so most of that, we just have to say, you know what, that's okay, because I am in this role. And so I must belong here. Yeah, it can be a little hard when the mind kind of gives like negative perceptions that are completely untrue yes. and grounding yourself in reality and saying, I'm here and I deserved it. It's really just helpful. So thank you for that answer. Um, Lucy had a question. She says, I am a nanny for a family which helps me pay for school and it isn't her primary job, but she says it doesn't allow her a ton of time to get uh, other experiences like clinical experiences and health related experiences. So uh, she says that it, the uh, nanny job is really fun and has helped her grow as a person, but of course it doesn't uh, directly relate to medicine like other experiences would. So she's asking, would it be worth mentioning on an MD or PA application when they're asking for those experiences? I would say, Lucy, you know, to the extent that it has contributed to your decision and your development towards the medical profession. Um, you know, if, if you love working with kids and you really want to work with kids in pediatrics or um, in women's health, I would say absolutely that's relevant. Also, I mean, who better to organize than someone who chases after three or four kids and can still stand at the end of the day? I mean, I'm biased, but... <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, these skills are so underrated. Um, absolutely, you can explain it in a way that is relevant to your growth and development. Will it count as a clinical experience? Probably not. Um, does it count as a personal experience that has helped you grow and develop? Yes. Um, so Lucy, what I would say is don't give up seeking out clinical experiences um, that do fit what they're looking for. So don't discount those. You still need those. Um, but also represent yourself for, for the way that you've grown and developed because that's important too. Awesome. Thank you. And I personally, I think uh, dealing with kids just gives you so much patience and builds so much character. So hats off to you, Lucy, for uh, managing all that along with school and all the other experiences. We have um, an incredible, she was a former dean. She just recently retired um, at the School of Nursing. And so, you know, as, as the deans and the higher administrators, they always give the speeches at graduation and um, at our events. And uh, whenever there was a baby crying or a child crying in the audience she would look around and she would say don't hush your babies don't hush your babies don't hush your children they're they're part of our lives and look if we can't handle a little background noise as future healthcare providers we're in the wrong profession <laughs> thank you so much for that um, this was actually our last question. So just a little last question to wrap things up. If you had any advice for our future pre-health students and our amazing students my, here. My advice is to enjoy it. Um, you're at such a fun time in your lives. If you find an area of medicine or nursing or science that you really enjoy, just dig in, have fun with it. Um, get to know your faculty and the other students around you so that you can really be part of the community and, and grow together. Um, and, and just enjoy, enjoy your path. There's so many, so many fun things ahead of you. Awesome. So we're just gonna go ahead and do our wrap up presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. Sandholt for that amazing presentation and those uh, awesome responses you articulated so much and gives, gave so much advice. So I appreciate your um, work here today. Um, I think we learned a lot from our wonderful speaker and considering this, I do ask everyone to kind of reflect on these three questions. 
what brought you to the session today, what are three major takeaways you got, and what do you want to learn more about after today's session? So these uh, reflection questions are not required by any means, but they're just a little prompt to have you uh, document in a journal maybe, just reflecting your thoughts on the uh, presentation so you can look at them later or perhaps use them in your future applications because this is a really good uh, experience um, just learning about different professions. So if you want to learn more about free health shadowing and get involved, we have a little bit that we allow students to do. Uh, you can write your reflections, the reflection questions that I had in this slide. You can definitely type up a little reflection and submit it at www.freehealthshadowing.com slash blog submissions and hopefully your submission will get published. So another thing to add to your application and just uh, experiences in writing. I'm the editor in chief and I really look forward to any submissions that you have. So if you wanted to learn more about our program, as I mentioned, we have our asynchronous volunteer opportunities and our team member volunteer opportunity. Our team member is more hands-on. Both of them are completely remote, but our team member uh, one is more hands-on and you have a more leadership skills. You are able to lead uh, maybe 60, 20 uh, volunteers and in certain tasks and projects. Uh, such as graphic design, social media promotion, the editorial team, and so much more. So uh, whatever you decide to do, you can do so in the links in the chat. And I look forward to seeing you if you decide to become a team member. So once again, we are humbly asking that if you are financially able to, to please donate because it does cost a lot to keep our website up and running and our Zoom and some of the research programs that we're working on with some of our professionals, which will cost uh, money in the future. So if you are financially able to or know someone else who can, please consider sending just a few dollars to our Venmo or PayPal because it just costs a lot to keep our program running. And as I mentioned, if you did donate $10, you are able to receive a certificate to uh, get a free uh, a dozen of donuts for, from Krispy Kreme, which is a great deal. So uh, don't miss out on that. And we would also like to mention that just mentioning our program to other students, just to spread the word around and have uh, pre-health sh shadowing students jump on this opportunity and get their shadowing hours, especially when so many have been rejected because of the pandemic. And um, a few places are slowly opening up, but it's really nice to have this opportunity. So now for the part we've all been waiting for, how to earn a digital certificate for the virtual shadowing hours. So first you will be signing up at freehealthshadowing.com. Just make sure you're logged into our website and you will be looking for our professionals page. Just type in Dr. Cara uh, Sandholt and you will find her there. Uh, after you complete, uh, complete viewing the presentation, you can take the quiz. It is a 10 uh, question multiple choice quiz. You have to get seven out of 10 right to uh, earn your certificate uh, for your two hours of virtual shadowing. You have 30 minutes per attempt and you have two attempts to take this assessment. If you run into any difficulties and the quiz doesn't load or you don't see the questions, please contact us at info at freehealthshadowing.com and we'll try to help you out. And to ensure that our website does not crash, we do recommend waiting a little bit after the live session to take the quiz so our website doesn't crash. And last but not least, our quiz is open indefinitely. So you're able to take it tonight, tomorrow, or next month. It really doesn't matter. But once you open it, you have 30 minutes and you've got to attempt. Once you've passed the quiz, you can click on the finish course button at the bottom of your professionals page. And there will be a little box that tells you to download your certificate and it verifies your virtual shadowing hours. You can download your certificate for your personal records, but on our website, you actually have um, a record of all of your certificates you earned in the past if you click on your profile. So uh, downloading is just for your personal needs. If you happen to miss a part of the session or you just want to go back and view uh, some of the lovely things our speaker has said and view other sessions we've had in the past, you can go onto our YouTube channel, which is Pre-Health Shadowing, and you can view all of our previous recordings. You can actually take an assessment and ver earn virtual shadowing hours through the previous recordings as well. So if you see a session that you like, you can watch it and then take the quiz for it at our website. So you can take as many post shadowing assessments you'd like and all of the quizzes for them are open indefinitely. And we have a variety of health professions 
health professionals from OT, PT, nursing, uh, professors, MD. So be sure to check it out and like look at the awesome presentations we have. So last but not least, be sure to follow us on social media. We uh, show if we have a session on our Instagram and our email list and also on our website. So we are currently booked every weekday through June. So if you are able to, just be sure to check our social media and our email list just to be caught up on when we have our sessions. And I hope to see you guys there. So thank you all for joining today. And please stick around if you have any questions for myself or other team members. But otherwise, uh, thank you all so much for being here. Thank you, Dr. Sandholt, for being here. This shadowing session is officially over and I invite you all to log off.